Uh, Oké, okay. René Roelofs en uh, Paul Scheffer, the authors of this film. And maybe also a big hand of applause for Gerard Nijssen, who was just here, the, the guy who found all, all the footage, uh, I suppose. Gerard Nijssen. Should, should we say uh, thank God for archives? Yes, uh, good, yeah, that there are archives and, and that they are accessible in, in some countries more than others. Yeah. Like in France, it's, it's fantastic. You have uh, INA has put the whole French uh, uh, television archive online. And the on the other hand, you have the BBC, where you have to apply for every little bit uh, you want to have in writing, and then you get paper back, and you have to choose, and then they eventually send you something. Right. Um, or I they don't send you something. And, and you have to pay lots of pounds, uh, I suppose. Yeah, but not only yeah. financially is there a burden, but um, there was also one fragment um, that we chose from Newsnight, and it was um, seen as too sensitive, and uh. they wouldn't give it to us. Okay. It was Jeremy Paxman interviewing Abu Jaja and basically losing the argument. A and he Perhaps didn't that was the reason, I don't know. Oh, interesting. We're yeah. going to speak to him soon for another show, so we'll ask him. Ask him um, I understood that, um, that the, the first idea of the film was um, doing interviews with people who could enlighten us on this subject and that you did a lot of interviews but then decided we're not going to use them, we'll, we'll tell the story only with the footage that we find in archives. Yes, that's right. Why? Yeah, as you saw in the credits, a long list of people we spoke in uh, seven, eight countries in Europe. Uh, we interviewed all those people, but in, in the only in research. We never shot any f any footage of them. We didn't do the interviews on camera, but we planned to do them. Uh, at the same time, we were collecting, uh, with the great help of Gerard, uh, the uh, archival material. And then somehow in the process, we decided uh, people uh, talking about migration, migration, integration, on the archive material in the time that it happens, feels stronger than if they sit on a chair f 50 years later and remember things. Hmm. So then we decided we have to make a, a rigorous uh, decision and, and skip all the interviews. Now I saw a lot of footage that I'd naturally never seen before and that is striking, so. <laughs> striking so. to me. Like oh. uh, uh, the selecting almost of the cattle in Morocco and Turkey. Oh. And I'd, I had no idea that people were treated like, it looks a little bit like slave trading. Yeah. Were you surprised by any of the footage that you uh, found in the archives? Definitely, yeah. I mean, I mean, touched, for example, these two young children. You know, this interaction between this boy with a Turkish background uh, helping the other guy. Who is apparently not that fluent in his own language. Yeah. And how it evolves, that's a moving little scene. And, um, but also saw, for example, the footage of the Afrikaner rally to stay with the Dutch material. I, I was shocked by it, but I was even more shocked that many people who've seen the film were that shocked by it because they haven't, didn't not even know that it happened at the time. So for me, making the film, and I think that's for both of us true, that um, being caught in present day discussions about migration, you know, there's such a lack of memory. There's such a lack of an idea where it all started. And we wanted to recreate a narrative, you know, starting where it started, at the end of the 50s somewhere, and then telling the whole story that you can see it uh, in two hours, and that all these lapses in the memory, or especially for a younger generation that hadn't seen it at all, I thought that was um, an important thing to do. So what, what would you like us to take away from this film? Because uh, the arguments uh, that you see in the 60s and the 70s are basically very much alive in these days. It's, it's exactly the same. Maybe black and white is color now and, and video is film or the quality of the images is better, but it's exactly the same. Yeah, that's, that's what we discovered, yes, um, by looking at... at uh, uh, archival footage from, from the end of the 40s till, till now. Um, history repeats itself and the, the issues that, that were happening then are still issues and a reaction to new groups coming into a society uh, are still the same. It's like Anil Ramdas says in, the, in one of the last uh, scenes. Uh, uh, now we are uh, cursing the Poles and uh, 
um, what's the other group he was talking about? Romanians. Romanians. Romanians yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, in five years' time, uh, or next year probably, it will be the, the, the yeah, the Romanians uh, coming uh, in the East. So, so is that yeah. worrisome or is that uh, exactly the opposite? Uh, because nothing basically changes, everything yeah. goes its course and you have some some uh, violence in, in an area that you forget about uh, 20, but 30 years later. May I disagree a little bit? I mean, we, this is also a continuous <laughs> argument between yeah. the two of us, and that's the beauty. Of Where do you disagree? No, no, I think um, it's true that history repeats itself, but not with the same groups. Mm -hmm. So, for example, um, you see the Italians and the Spanish migrants of the 50s and the f 60s, nobody talks about them anymore. Many of them have gone home, but many have remained. Nobody talks about them anymore. They have, they have married to Dutch women and they are yeah. totally integrated. And yeah. nobody talks about the Surinamese migrants uh, that much anymore. Um, people are angry about it. When you're in the Belmont Mia, people say, nobody talks about us anymore. And then you can say, count your blessings. That's a good anyway. thing. Anyway, yeah. but um, so I think um, it also shows a pattern uh, where history, I mean, we end with Abu Talib and then we go to the scene where you see a guest worker with a child on his arm, which could be Abu Talib. So in 50 years, something has changed. Although many of the same themes are recurrent with new groups. And I think what we wanted to do is to show, you know, give people a sense of, in the Netherlands, we are so caught in the discussion as national. You know, we think we are pretty unique. Mm. And what we wanted to show is not only in the Netherlands, but in Germany, in France, in Britain, in Sweden, in Belgium, basically the same story is going on. And nobody talks about it from a European perspective. And that is difficult. How do you condense it? But I think that was um, one of the objectives as well, to create a European feeling. Yeah. Now, the title of your film, I thought it was a positive title, The Land of Promise. Or was it irony? Um, no, it was not irony, because uh, most of the people that, that, that come to, uh, to Holland, to Europe, um, are in, in, uh, in search of a better life. Um, and so for them it's the land of promise, but not all promises are, are kept or are coming out. And so there's not ir irony on it, but you see maybe on, on, on the poster, you see a little bit of the fade of the, the word promise. <laughs> so it's not easy. Sooner or later, reality comes in. No, I think what we also try to do is to show the story from the perspective of migrants, but also from the perspective of those who were already here. And to continuously shift those two perspectives, you see there are promises or expectations on all sides, and it collides, and we see the conflict as rather something that happens in all huge migration histories, also in America, lots of conflict. And um, so the promise is, uh, in that sense, is always turning into um, realities which are far more conflictuous. So how would you describe these times now that we are living in? Is it, uh, is it extremely bad or negative for migrants? Is it the same as it was 10 years ago? Is it very good? <laughs> I think uh, um, everybody should make its own mind up about this, you know, answer that question him or herself. I think uh, what Anil Ramna says in the end is very true that you cannot say integration um, is done. It's completed, yeah. because then you would say society is completed. It's a continuous process of inventing and reinventing a society. I mean, we talk now. I was interviewed this morning by a German journalist about Gerard de Piet. <laughs> and I, I try to give him a sense that it's also a symbolic struggle which fits into a much larger narrative where traditions are questioned by new groups and are invented and reinvented. So I'm basically far more optimistic about the whole story than 15 years ago. Okay. But I don't know how you look at this. Yeah, to me it's, uh, it's a fact that we are, uh, have become a, a, a migrant society and it will never go back to, uh, to like uh, Holland used to be uh, 30, 40 years ago. Yeah. Haven't we always so been? A fact I mean, this, is the, this is the country that, that everybody says is a migrant country since uh, the 17th century. Yeah, that's nonsense, because if you look at the 18th century and the 19th century, same for America. Nobody came in? No, very little migration. And if you look at America between 1920 and 1960, the, the percentage of migrants in America, which still thought of itself as a nation of immigrants, dropped from 10% first generation to 2.5% in 1970. 
due to a very restrictive immigration policy and afterwards it returned. So there are ebbs and flows in all migration mm -hmm. history. Okay. Anybody here? There is a microphone somewhere. If you want to ask a question, please stand up and, um, and shoot. <coughs> Where the microphone is first. Could you please stand yeah. up? Okay, uh, first uh, I want to give a compliment for this very uh, educational um, documentary, you can say. Uh, but I was wondering from how you um, look at um, now the immigration of uh, refugees and asylum seekers and people. That's also a group of foreigners coming in more and more. And how, now. Nah, in the, in the Dutch uh, or U yeah. European countries, they are not that's, really... That's a good question, because the yeah. element of uh, refugees, a Lampedusa, for example, that's not in your film. Well, and it's, it's a serious group of people trying to come in. Not legally, but... Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Not everything is in. Uh, of course, that's, that's, uh, that's an important group. But um, also the other migrants, whether they are post-colonial or, uh, or the, the migrant workers, they, they came for most of the time, for the same reasons, economic reasons, I think, eh? like most, most, uh, most, mig most... But did you talk about, sh should we also include in this film the people who are trying to get in, uh, in little boats with, and taking the risk that they will die, which is happening uh, now? Yeah, we, we had so, so many cuts of this film with scenes in it, like uh, uh, people from Africa uh, floating in the, in the Strait of uh, Gibraltar on the beaches, and... Uh, we made decisions uh, also whether we should take this film right up to the present time eh, to make it um, actuel. What's the word in English? Actual. Current. 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 Okay. But we decided uh, it's better to show a universal pattern uh, and not try to be uh, current with this film. So that's I one of the reasons that we didn't show these scenes. Yeah. No, I just wanted to say it's not, uh, not uh, my remark was not on why it's not in the movie. It's more li like uh, the discussion this will give. What's yeah, really on how d are we going mm. to deal with refugees, asylum seekers, yeah. illegal people? If you ask, people, me, per uh, yeah. if you ask me personally, everybody has the right to try to, to come into Europe, to find a better life. Yeah. I would do the same thing. Yeah, but so uh, that yeah. can And luckily, I'm not a politician that I have to make mm. the decisions about it. No, no but, but as a citizen... Um, we are responsible. But, but, but I guess that um, what I like about the end of the film is that it's open-ended and doesn't try to give straightforward answers. But you see Cameron saying, you know, multiculturalism is something, uh, a huge mistake. And then the guy from the BBC in a talk show saying, I'm tricultural, I can be me, and I can be we at the same time. And don't squeeze me in a box. And then you get Merkel and says, you know, this multiculti is völlig gescheitert. Mm -hmm. And then you get Anil Ramdas. So I think, you know, it's not, trying to convey a message in the sense that is where it should go. It's trying to recreate a sense of history and a scene from both perspectives and from a European perspective. And I think that those are three ways in distancing yourself from all these debates where we are caught in. It's a way of trying to give a larger view. Yeah. And I think it has n not been done. Because it's it's funny for you to say so because you started this debate or you were one of the people who started this yeah. debate how long ago in NRC Handelsblad, 10 years ago? And before the First World War. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but now, what is the goal of this film? Because you say it's open-ended, and that's exactly what I wanted to ask you. Because your view, your personal view, it could be anything. After um, having this film seen, I, I don't know exactly where yeah. you are, what your point of view is, if you have a position in this. Um, do well, you I have think a the position? the point of view in is, in my view, <laughs> is a way of looking, creating a narrative, that is already saying something, creating a European narrative is something, saying there's legitimacy on both sides, and there should be empathy on both sides. That is to say, we, I think we show images which are very strong of migrants, but also of native people struggling with the new reality of migration. So that is a way of looking, but it isn't choosing sides, it's exactly trying to be above the question of guilt and I think that's what I try to do in the book after this whole discussion, trying to develop a way of looking in a narrative that is broader and tries to give a sense of uh, ongoing history. So this film should not start a new debate? That's always good a debate, but uh, we didn't want to make per se a, a, a political film. We, want, we, we more wanted to make a humanistic film maybe. 
because uh, in the film, although you see politicians, it's it's only short statements, and there's no real political line that they express, and so that's a, that's our choice. We we didn't want and basically not to have politicians in the film and not to have experts on the subject of migration in the film, yeah. mm -hmm. but to show what, what how it has affected us and the, the countries around us, not Paul Schaeffer, for instance, in the film. No, <laughs> it would be horrible, uh, indeed. Uh, how, is it, how it has affected us, and, and maybe, um, maybe con convey a message that um, this is the way it is now, and uh, it's irreversible. There was a question here, I think. So. Uh, hello, uh, first of all, uh, congratulations with this fantastic uh, uh, film about this, uh, well, fragile subject, apparently. Um, I've, I've just a practical question as a filmmaker or documentary maker. Um, it was mentioned that for seven years you were working on this project. Mm -hmm. uh, which was the most uh, time-consuming part? Money. Money? <laughs> yeah, as always. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, as you can imagine, it's not easy to, uh, to explain this kind of film uh, in a written uh, screenplay to a film commission or to the television. Uh, so that has been uh, the most difficult part. And we were rejected many times with this film, the script, uh, the, the, when the script was finished. So that took the mo most, most time. But also finding all the archival footage and, and editing that took about two years also. Luckily, the broadcasting organization I work for, I saw in the credits, uh, is sponsoring you. Yes. Will they, will they brought will be um, a television series. So we will oh, cut it so into yeah. three parts in okay. the yeah. first three weeks of January. That was my Sunday, next question. Will half they past eight. So they won't broadcast it uh, in this format? No, which is a pity, I think, because yeah. it's, it's tried to, in one experience, to show the history from the beginning to uh, the day of today, and it's a pity, you know, to cut it in, in Belgium, yeah. it will be in, in its entirety on the television. Yeah, it's so ridiculous um, to take yeah, another three the parts. Belgians are far more advanced than I we know. are. <laughs> as, you, <laughs> as you probably know. Yeah, any Belgians here who want to ask a question? Yes, there is one. <laughs> the, maybe you could stand up and just uh, scream. Just yeah, <laughs> we'll hear you. Oh, is the microphone still somewhere around? Uh, I can talk now. Okay. That's a difficult question. <laughs> um. Well, I, I, no, I think it's, Paul it's the not that difficult, actually. <laughs> no, in the sense that it's a clear choice. That was also, for me, one of the motives of writing the book, to stress the universal over the particular. So, of course, I mean, there are huge differences between the Turkish community in the Netherlands and Germany. But if you really look at it, there's a huge difference between the Turkish community in Cologne and... Berlin, but if you really look at it, there's a huge difference between Turkish community in Pankov and in Kreuzberg. You can differentiate as long as you will, and that is true. But there is also another approach saying, you know, what are the universals of the migration experience? And we were looking for that, to create a story that is rising above those particularities that characterize every migrant community, and to emphasize something that is, uh, gives you a, a general feel of the emotions and psychological complexities of migrating, but also for the complexities of those who already were there and have a voice and a legitimacy to their voice as well. And the last perspective was so difficult to create that because there is almost no footage of out of tone of people who talk in a little bit like human beings. So the empathy which is invested in trying to create an image of migrants is com almost absent in all the documentaries and all the footage about native populations who most of the time are xenophobic, you know, um, with foam on their mouth, mm. shouting. And so Monsieur Ponsy is for me a key scene, that this French man who's very subdued, talks very, you know, hesitating about what's happening in his neighborhood. 
And we were looking for those scenes as well, you know, to see it from the other perspective as well. Did you limit yourself in, in some way or the other? Because your only source is archival footage and exactly what you are saying now. You could have gone out with a camera and asked people, okay, so how do you really feel about your neighborhood has been changing? What are the good and the bad things yeah. about that? Yeah, I, I think I, s I said something about that before. Uh, we found these issues uh, came back in the arch archival footage and we found uh, main characters in the archival footage that were saying more or less the same things. And we thought it, it, it was stronger to to show it in the in the in the time it's happening, and w when to them history is still uh, unknown, they don't know what's around the corner. Uh, rather than ask them uh, to look back at something, also from a, from a, from a filmic uh, point of view, um, we we like this this form. Yeah. It's a crazy puzzle. It must have been very difficult to tell the story with source material of other people. Yeah, it was till till the very last was it was the question uh, whether we should still include interviews. Eh? We we kept it open till maybe till March this year in one of the final stages of the editing because uh, we didn't know uh, does it work without interviews this kind of film. So we had we had uh, we had test audiences look at it and ask them if they 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 understood what we wanted to say or, or if, if if enough came out that we we, we liked to to say. And uh, because that was the case, we decided in a very late uh, stage to skip all the interviews. I didn't yeah, know that, that you was really, you know, that uh, with Rene, because he has made uh, more films, you know, with a lot of presence of archival footage, like Dutch Approach on the Moluccan train jacking um, for part television series. <laughs> and I thought, um, you know, if you come to think of it, how much voiceovers there are normally in documentary films telling you how to see what you see. And all the paternalism involved, actually, you know, by trying to steer the viewer. And I thought, you know, it's such a relief just to see, you know, the history of ideas, of way of presenting migration. You know, all the commentaries from the past, very interesting, you know, to hear it and the way it was portrayed at the time. But to be absent, you know, were very present in the editing, but completely absent in, like, saying, how you should look at what you see. And I thought, you know, because it takes you out of the flow of time, it takes you out of the historical sensation immediately, because then you get what Geert Mark has done, which I greatly admire in many other ways, but then he says, you know, how are people like in the 30s in Germany, how could he be so naive to walk behind someone like uh, Hitler? And I think, of <coughs> course, for partly we know it, and why should you say it? Leave it open hmm. to anybody to s think whatever he thinks. And I think that's, for me, that was really a discovery, uh, and that was definitely René's insistence, because yeah. against all these funds who say, you know, you should explain more, you should give people a hold on, you know, a grip by would telling you, them what yeah, to yeah, see. I, I would you consider doing this on other subjects, for example, women's liberation? You could do, Why not? Could Why do not? the same yeah. film about yeah. that with archival yeah, footage. I think <laughs> René and I were not the first persons <laughs> to make a film on that topic. Actually, I think you would no. be very well <laughs> equipped for that. <laughs> yeah, <you think> so? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> other questions? <laughs> Please stand up and ask your question. I'm just curious if you're, um, during the whole process of uh, your research and working on this documentary, if your ideas on uh, migration and the multicultural society has changed? For me personally, but yes. Both, I would like to know. Okay, shall I yeah. say it first then? Uh, it, it started, uh, for me it started uh, when I read uh, Paul's book for the first time, uh, Land van Aankomst, it's called Immigrant Nations in, in English. Uh, it gave me a sense of, of I, I was struggling with the subject like so many people are struggling with, with, with the subject in your, your environment. Uh, in this in this case, in this uh, matter, and uh, for me, uh, it became very clear that uh, that our society has changed, and we have to to deal with it some some way and uh, during the process uh, for for me personally, it was great to to talk about it for years and I feel much better now. I feel much more that I have a sort of uh, feeling uh, well we somehow we get we will get to uh, to some kind of a New nation, nation building, as Anil Ramdas says, and that's that's the only thing we can do. But is that new information for you? Did you did you think about a different? What is new information? That it's a form of nation building, <coughs> that it's like a continuous process, that it's never going to be finished. Was that new or? 
and no, but to accept it is is for me was was yeah. Okay. You know, if you want. Well, for me, you know, I mean, I think writing and creating such a film is something that I th I feel that it's a great privilege to be able to do that because it gives you a sense of having a grip on your own reality, mm -hmm. to say something back, so to say, to give a form to something that is, you know, surrounding you is quite often chaotic. Uh, you know, so by creating or recreating a reality, it gives you a sense uh, of reconciliation with that reality. You know, by not only understanding that something irrevocably has happened, but that you can also learn to see behind the sense of loss, of losing a known world, that there is perhaps a deeper enrichment. And I personally resent those people who say, you know, it's so fantastic to have Turkish culture in the Netherlands. And then when you ask them what a Turkish culture is, they n always end up in the kitchen, mm -hmm. she's kebab, which I find a little <laughs> bit insulting because there are serious Turkish literature and serious Turkish music, but nobody talks about that. So I thought the deeper enrichment is that it asks the society so many fundamental questions, like what is equal treatment? Like what is freedom of speech? What is freedom of religion? And are we living up to our own ideals? That is for me the real enrichment, this continuous soul searching. So for me, writing about it and making this film uh, definitely changed me in many, many ways. That would be a great ending to this interview. Thank you very much. And um, <coughs> thank you for your questions.